Hello everybody, thank you for stopping in for this video. Today we're going to be talking about finite element analysis. More specifically, SOLIDWORKS Simulation and its big brother, Abacus. In today's video, we're going to be presenting a demonstration of SOLIDWORKS Simulation and Abacus as they approach a multi-step problem. In particular, it will be the installation of two rubber bushings into a steel control arm, followed by the installation of a brass fitting into the bushings themselves. For the majority of the video today, we're going to be talking about how to set up the simulation environment within Abacus because it is the preferred solution for this problem. Think of this as a gentle introduction to Abacus if you're already a SOLIDWORKS simulation user. But before we get started though, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can stay up to date with all of our future talks about Abacus and SOLIDWORKS simulation. During this demonstration, we'll be talking about multiple facets of the simulation software, including the Abacus associative interface, the differences between the contact algorithms that we have made available for us, General Contact being the industry-leading tool for contact modeling within Abacus, the stepwise loading approach that can be taken within Abacus, and lastly, considerations as it relates to parallel computing within Abacus. Below in the description, we'll have timestamps where we divide the video up into different chapters concerning individual portions of the analysis. But with that, we'll move on into the demonstration portion of the video today, and Sam will take it from here with SOLIDWORKS Simulation. I'll start with the demonstration of how we'd approach this type of multi-step problem in SOLIDWORKS. Here we have a control arm, which will have a rubber bushing press fit into it. We will then insert a brass fitting into the rubber bushing. SOLIDWORKS Simulation users may be familiar with the shrink fit interaction. We can define this local condition when there is an interference modeled into the assembly. With this condition, we place the components into their final position in the assembly and use the solver to let the interference model comply into a shrink fit condition. Even in a nonlinear study, this method doesn't allow for any time stepping. We aren't able to use this local initial condition on the brass fitting because it can't be time stepped. Our scenario is sequential and the shrink fit condition is applied all at once in the initial time step. As a possible workaround, we can attempt to insert the brass fitting into the rubber bushing after this initial time step through a prescribed displacement. We see that SOLIDWORKS isn't able to achieve equilibrium and the solver fails with the brass fitting part partially inserted. If we are interested in seeing intermediate results on the bushing, as we will in Abacus, we'll have to do our best to increment the two events using a time curve in a nonlinear study using SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. This is the closest we can get to the Abacus stepwise loading approach. The key difference in SOLIDWORKS are that we aren't able to chain events together and we don't have the restart capabilities. So we have to apply both events in a single study which makes the overall problem more difficult to solve and limits our flexibility with adding, removing, or reordering steps. Knowing these limitations, we'll try using the available method in a nonlinear study to calculate results on the rubber bushing while it's being inserted, and also see if this will be able to solve to completion since the shrink fit initial condition didn't. We'll have more flexibility and a more appropriate contact condition on the rubber bushing with this method, so perhaps this will work better. As I mentioned a moment ago, the nonlinear solutions in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium are able to process nonlinear or sequential loads through a scaling factor and on-off switches. It's important to note that the time component shown here is what we refer to as pseudo-time. The time values input here are simply for scaling a load in respect to any other loads in the study and gives us some control over how gradually that load is applied compared to other loads. It is not real time. Aside from the input prescribed displacement, I've also used some stabilizing fixtures to help the solver maintain equilibrium on the bushings while the brass fitting is being pressed in. This one will keep the bushing from rotating. My last pre-processing condition to input is the manual definition of the faces for a sliding contact interaction. These manual surface selections are handled automatically with a general contact and abacus that Tom just discussed. As we will see, these manual surface contact conditions have limitations and are less accurate when compared to the general contact and abacus. <laughs> 
I found that in this particular case, the solver performed best when I selected each face pair in a separate interaction, rather than choosing a group or component level interaction. This was a bit more tedious, but the solve performed better this way. After running this study, we see that this option also fails partway through the solve. SolveWorks simply cannot handle this type of problem due to the limitations of the less accurate contact as well as having to run all the steps in the same study. This concludes the SolidWorks portion of the demonstration. I'll pass it back over to Tom now to see how we would handle this type of problem in Abacus. So we'll start things off by first loading the geometry into the Abacus CAE environment. We'll do this by using the associative interface. Go over to the tools, select SolidWorks, and then we'll auto assign a port. Once we get that affirmative notification, then we'll go over to our SolidWorks tab, save our file, make sure that our geometry is defined in the correct length system that we're working for, in our case we're using millimeters ton seconds, and then we'll export using the associative interface plugin button in SolidWorks. Now we'll rename the model just for clarity's sake in the future. Control arms bushing seems reasonable to me. Now we'll switch over to the property module in order to start defining some of our materials for the simulation. In this case, we're going to be using the Material Library Manager. This allows me to leverage individual Material Library files that I've saved in the past, and as it so happens to be, I copied over some of the material properties from the SolidWorks Material Library and put it into the unit system and material cards that Abacus is anticipating. We'll check these materials out and put them into the simulation environment, and then we'll be on our merry way. Looking at this steel material card we have first, we can see a Young's Modulus of about 210 GPA. And then looking forward to the bushing, we can see that this polyurethane is defined by an Ogden material card, as we see here, with biaxial planner and uniaxial test data. And if you go over here to this submenu, you can see all of the individual test data points that we're using for this. Again, we pulled this test data from the SolidWorks material library. So now the next thing you'll want to familiarize yourself with if you're a new Abacus user is the way that the tree works over on the left. You can see all of these object collections with parts, materials, calibrations, and so on all the way down. Within Abacus CAE, your geometry is typically sorted into categories of assembly instances and part level geometries. This is pretty similar to the idea of a SolidWorks part file and a SolidWorks assembly, in the sense that you can have one part file that is instanced multiple times, and any changes you make to the part file will then be propagated down towards the assembly. In our case, we'll have one part level definition for the bushing, but we'll have two instances when it comes to the assembly level. Additionally, we'll do all of our meshing on the part level rather than the assembly level. Starting off first with the meshing discussion is going to be the brass fitting. Now in contrast to SolidWorks simulation, Abacus CAE gives the user a lot more control in the creation of the mesh for the simulation. In the case of today's demonstration, we're going to be trying to stay as hexahedral as possible in order to showcase the competitive advantage of hexahedral elements. Hex elements are great for the simulation themselves, but they take a little bit more work on the front end in terms of pre-processing in order to get the mesh set up. This is done through the creation of partitions. In CAE, usually you'll use datums and partitions to chop your geometry down into more sweepable geometries. In my case, I'm pretty fond of using principal planes in order to create these large cuts between the geometries. So you'll see first that I grab the XY plane and the XZ plane, and it creates this little crosshair in our bushing in order for us to partition. On top of these two primary planes, I'm going to create a center cut between the bushing in order to create a center point between the top and the bottom. Now, what I can do is define my partition based on those planes that we created. And you can see that the color is changed here because we have set our mesh defaults as the default coloring. Originally it was orange showing that it was unmeshable with hexes and wedges, and now it is yellow to show that it is hex meshable. We want to try to create yellow and green for hex meshable geometries. And we'll just continue on now, highlighting and sh uh, selecting which cells we're going to partition, and partition with those cutting planes. With that, I can expand now the feature tree, and you can see that all of these features that I've created are now located underneath the part file. These are our datum planes, as well as our partitions. Now that we have our bushing all partitioned up and ready to go, we can do a solid or a long left click to hold down on this button here and switch to the global seed definition. From previous runs, I know that 2.5 is a pretty good mesh size for this, and we can mesh the part, and it's looking pretty nice. We got hexahedrals all the way around, and it's looking good. Now we'll switch over into the, oh, sorry, wrong module right here. We're going to switch over to the property module so that we can have access to the reference point tools, and we're going to go and drop a reference point down in the center. 
but in order to do that, we're going to have to create a datum point, which is midway between the two on this central axis, so one here, and then one over on the other side down there. And now with that center point already created, we're going to go back, click, click Tools Reference Point, and then you can see that RP is located right there. And also to verify it, it's in the feature tree over here on the left. So now with that, we can now add a section, which is a collection of all the material properties to our geometry. We'll create the section, give it a material, we're going to add in the brass here. And then once we've created that section assignment, we can assign it to the geometry and to the mesh, thus giving our material properties a map from our section to our mesh. Now if we switch back to the assembly mode, we can then go in here and turn on the mesh visualization, and you can see that, hey, look, the brass pin is now adequately meshed and none of the other parts are because we haven't done it yet. So now we'll move into the bushing as the next piece here. And again, we're gonna be doing the mesh on the part level so that we only have to mesh one bushing and it'll show up twice in the assembly. So now starting things off with our bushing geometry, we'll first drop in a datum axis of revolution and two primary planes for us to partition our geometry with. This kind of just allows us to break it into four quadrants for our sweep mesh. And now you'll see that it's changed color to yellow, meaning that it is a sweep meshable geometry. From prior runs, I can tell you that about 1.5 millimeters seems to be decent for the mesh size for this. And what we can do now is go into the display group, select cells, and select one of our newly partitioned cells, and hide it. And that allows us to see that interior face. And the mesh is looking decent, but a little bit coarse around our areas of high contact. So we can add a local mesh distribution in order to increase the fidelity in that area. About 12 elements might be a good starting point for that bottom edge, and that fillet right there, where we've got a lot of contact coming in, let's bump that up to four. Now we can remesh, and you'll see that it's created some pretty small elements in that area. So what we might want to do is go and change the meshing control, or the meshing algorithm that is used to create that. Rather than using hex, we can use hex dominant and use the medial axis to change the way that that surface is created before it's swept around that axis of revolution. So now if I remesh it and then go and rehide that particular area using undo, we can see that now it's got a much more structured grid to it. Uh, however, we can see a little bit of skew in that particular area that I'm not exactly fond of. So what we can do is modify that local distribution in that area, change that to three, and then remesh it. And you'll see that, you know, it looks a little bit better. There's still a little bit of skew in it, but it's something that we can work with for the purposes of this demo. So now with our mesh, I'm going to go back into the property module and bring everything back into the viewport. And then again, I will create a section similar to before. I'm going to make sure I have a unique name this time. Uh, but we're going to call this the bushing section. And then to that, we're going to apply the material of the polyurethane Ogden. And then now that we have our section, we can assign it to the geometry and mesh that we created by using a section assignment object. So now that we've assigned that section assignment, you'll see that it's changed green. Green means good in this particular scenario and we're ready to go. But for future sake, I'm gonna add a reference point to that top. It's gonna be used as a control point for some of our couplings in the future. But for now, let's just talk about the mesh and how even though we've just meshed the part, if we switch over to the assembly, you'll see that, hey, it's shown up for both instances of that. So we've got the exact same mesh shown up in two different locations. Uh, it's starting to get a little bit cluttered in terms of the visibility, so I'm going to turn off the mesh visualization, and we're going to move back over into the last part for us to mesh, which is going to be the actual control arm steel itself. Now this part's going to be a little bit more involved as it relates to the partitioning work required to cut this down into hex meshable geometries. And while you're going to be able to see all the clicks along the way, I'm not necessarily going to cover it in the exact same amount of detail. If you would like a deeper dive into some of the meshing capabilities within CAE, please comment that below and we'll be happy to make a video about that. But fundamentally, the partitioning process is about visualizing small bite-sized pieces for the meshing algorithm as compared to one giant object itself. And you'll see that I'm using many of the same tools that we used before, primary planes or all defined datum planes based on three points, and then partition the geometry based on those three points itself. The only new command we've seen so far is going to be the extend face, which just allows for a partition at the juncture between that swept rectangle and the lateral face of the cylinder. Throughout this partitioning process, you'll see that the color changes for each of the cells as we start chopping this down into bite-sized pieces. Again, we're shooting for yellow and green for hex meshable geometries. Another new command you'll see me use is the auto partition of face, which allows for a further subdivision of the source mesh for the sweep. But for the majority of the partitioning process, it's pretty rinse and repeat. You find your primary planes, you extend faces to cut at the junctures, and then you break down into quadrants around the cylinders. 
Now, it's not uncommon for when you're partitioning a larger object for one cell's partitioning rules to invalidate the rules of the next cell over. The way that you can remedy this is to try to use similar partitioning planes in order to create a smooth transition between the two. So as you can see, as it changed from yellow to orange, we can change it back from orange to yellow by partitioning both the beam in the center and the center cylinder about the same longitudinal plane. When it comes to hex mesh geometries, the majority of the mesh control is defined by your partitions, and that kind of comes about based on the amount of experience that you have and just general exposure and practice to use with the tools. For the mesh of the steel control arm, I ended up going with a target element size of about 5 millimeters, as well as a hex dominant sweep mesh. This allows for the creation of tetrahedral and wedge elements, which allows for a little bit more of a relaxed approach to this sweep mesh. Same thing as before, we need to create a section assignment object, but in order for our section assignment to assign a section, we need to have a section to begin with. Say that five times fast. We're going to use this little button on the side here to create our section, and this just showcases that you don't have to make everything beforehand, you can create as you go. So with our section now assigned, we're going to be able to switch over into the assembly and see that our assembly is pretty cluttered with a bunch of datum planes. Uh, what we can do is hide them and then only show the ones that we need to see, and then I'm actually going to rotate some of our assembly instances in order to create a little bit neater of an environment. We're going to do this by using a parallel face-to-face -face constraint. We're going to select first the movable instance and then select the fixed instance. And we're going to do that all the way through all of the instances so that everything is lined up about the partition planes. Now we can transition into the discussion of couplings and how to set influence control points for the center faces of these holes. In order to do this, we're going to need reference points for these couplings. However, for this first one, we don't end up having a datum, so we're going to have to create a datum point between two points in this case. And for the second one, we don't actually even need to create a datum point since our global origin is set at the center of that lateral hole. Therefore, we can just put a reference point there and go over to the other one and try and put a reference point there. I'm going to delete that extra one that I accidentally made. Now we can start creating our coupling by first creating some sets for our coupling points and selecting the surface in which that coupling control point is going to be controlling based on a tangency propagation. Uh, so it's going to be a certain angular tolerance and it's going to propagate about that inner surface. And now is where we can define the kind of coupling that we're going to be using. For today's demo, we're going to be using either kinematic or continuum distributing couplings. The kinematic coupling is going to be more similar to a rigid coupling between the two of them, whereas the continuum distributing coupling is going to be more of a loose fit sort of relationship between the controlled surfaces in relation to the control point. So now what I'm going to do is hide that top brass fitting, and we're going to start adding some continuum distributing couplings for the top surface of these bushings. However, since we have two instances of the same part, it makes more sense for us to define our surfaces on the part level rather than on the assembly level. So we're going to jump back over into the part level and define our surfaces there. In this case, since we only have two instances, it only saves us a couple clicks. But if, for example, you had 15 or 16 bushings, defining the surface once would save us a lot of time and effort during pre-processing. And with that, we can switch back into the assembly module and begin to define our couplings for the bushing, one for the top and one for the bottom. In this case, rather than selecting the surfaces in the viewport explicitly, what we're going to do is select this surfaces menu over in the bottom right. Then from the menu, we can select the relevant surface. I'd recommend highlighting the selected surface just to make sure that you're selecting the proper surface for the particular coupling you're defining. Now that we have the top bushing coupling defined, we're going to move on to the bottom and it's going to be the exact same process. We're using a continuum coupling for this particular case because we want that surface to deform a little bit as it's being loaded during the scenario. We don't want it rigidly locked in place. Now what we can do is invert the display for all of the features shown in the current viewport, and this gives us just the brass pin, the last coupling that we need to define. But in order to define the coupling, again we need to create a control point. In this case, we're going to go back to the part module and create the reference point on the central point datum then we'll define a node set with this reference point. And the reason why we're creating this set is because we need one in order to pull both the reactionary forces and the displacements in the pin at the point of installation. And now we're going to switch back over to the assembly module and define our coupling constraint for the brass fitting itself. And this time we're going to use a kinematic coupling because we want that inner lateral face to be locked in place rigidly with respect to the control point for the brass fitting. Now that we have all of our couplings all defined, we can now move into defining some of the initial conditions for our simulation. First thing I'm going to do is hide all of these datum planes since we don't need them anymore, and we're going to go start creating some boundary conditions for our couplings that we have created. 
The first is going to be a set of encaster boundary conditions for the couplings for the control arm itself. And you kind of see back and forth here, I accidentally clicked the wrong set for each of the encasters. But essentially all you have to do to create a new boundary condition is to double click the collections of boundary condition options. And then it'll give you a list saying what kind of boundary condition you want to create. In this case, we'll do a encaster boundary condition, give it a unique name, and then we'll click from the eligible sets, the relevant control point, and then click OK to accept it. Now we're going to do that for the other coupling of the control arm and move towards the bushings and the pin themselves. For those boundary conditions, we'll use fixed displacement because over the course of the simulation, we're going to modify what that fixed displacement is. In the initial condition, we're going to lock those all at zero displacement. However, as every step goes by, we're going to change those from zero displacement to a prescribed displacement. And now you see I've opened up the boundary conditions manager, and this can be a helpful tool that allows us to see multiple boundary conditions, or if you're in the loads manager, the loads. But as every step is added to the simulation, you'll see a new column in the manager, which allows you to see how particular boundary conditions and how loads change over the course of the simulation. More on that later. But for now, we're gonna to transition to talking about general contact and defining our general contact properties. To go alongside our general contact definition, we'll also need a contact property definition. This is where we can define all of the different properties and behavior for the contact domain. In this case, we're going to be using the default for the normal behavior, and then we'll add in a tangential behavior where we allow for some penalty friction to be enforced. In this case, our coefficient of friction is going to be 0 0.60. Now that we've created our contact property, we can go and create our general contact definition. You'll see that it says all with self as the general contact domain. And from there, you can assign to that general contact domain the contact property that we created. Now what we're going to go through is the process of creating all of the different steps. These are our amalgamations of different loads and boundary conditions throughout the simulation. First of which is going to be a slight bushing pressurization, basically the equivalent of pinching the bushing before you push it into the hole. For the bushing installation itself, we're going to be needing a much smaller time step in order for the solver to resolve the forces and the contact pressures that come about. This being the case, we're going to start out with an initial time increment of 0.05 and make sure that we have well over 100 in terms of the maximum number of increments per step. We're going to rinse and repeat and create a step with the exact same properties for the bottom bushing installation. And then we're going to create a very similar step for the brass pin installation. Now that we've told Abacus we want a multi-step simulation, we can go back into the Boundary Conditions Manager, and then you can see we have multiple columns, the first of which shows where each of the boundary conditions was created, and then how it propagates through the course of the simulation. For each of these cells within the Boundary Conditions Manager table, we can right-click and edit the definition in a particular step. And then, after it's been edited in one step, it'll be propagated to the remainder of the steps. This is how we go about creating the fixed displacement from our original zero fixed displacement for the bushings and for the brass pin. So now at this point, we have all of our boundary conditions set up and our displacements are ready to go. And now before I forget, I'm gonna create a history output for the reactionary forces and the displacement for that top pin. That way we can get a force displacement curve. To do this, we'll create a history output request and then set the domain to set and point it to the correct control point. And then we can go through the list and grab the displacements and the reactionary forces for that set. I mentioned earlier that we need a small, slight pressurization of the bushing in order to get this bushing to slide in. After we get the bushing past the initial portion of the installation, we don't really want that pressure sticking around. Remember, it's really only supposed to be a mimicking of like a pinching around the bushing before you push it in. Therefore, it doesn't really make sense for that pressure to still be there after you've made it past the initial threshold of the steel. Therefore, we can create a amplitude card to ramp this down. So originally it'll start out at one, then after a short amount of time, we're gonna ramp it to zero. And with that, we can now create our pressure load that is going to cause that slight pinching. And for that, we're gonna have to select all the surfaces around the top portion of the bushing, and then apply a very slight pressure load. Remember, we only want it to displace just a little bit before the insertion point. Now that we have the top pressure load defined, we can go back and do the exact same thing for the bottom pressure load. The reason why we're doing two different pressure loads is because we have two different steps for the insertion, and I want those pressures to be ramped off individually on their own. Now as we switch back over to the load manager, I can see that I incorrectly defined my loads to all start during the brass pin installation, and that's not what I want. I would rather have it in a way such that the top bushing is pressurized during the bushing pressurization stage, and then while I'm inserting the top bushing, we pressurize the bottom one. So it's kind of a cascading effect with that. 
Then I will ramp off the amplitude in the subsequent step after they've been pressurized. And now that we have both the pressurization and the ramping off of the pressurization taken care of, we have a fully functioning model and we are ready to run. To do this, we're going to create a job object where we can give it a particular name for the simulation, and then we can assign a certain amount of cores in which we want this job to run on. We're gonna right click and then hit submit. And now as it turns out, this job will end up erroring out pretty early on. In order to investigate how this error came about, we can open up the job monitor by right clicking on the job name itself and clicking monitor. From there, you can either look at the warnings, which will tell you something that may or may not influence the accuracy of the simulation, or you can look at the errors, and in this case it's saying just to look at the data file. Within the data file, we can look for the word error, and that will point us to potential sources of why this simulation crashed. In this particular case, it ends up being the case that our Poisson's ratio is pretty high. And because we didn't apply a hybrid element formulation, we're gonna end up with an error with the solver. When you're working with hyperelastic materials such as this Ogden model, it's necessary for us to specify hybrid element formulations. To fix this error, we're gonna go to the mesh module and modify the mesh for the bushing at the part level. From there, we can select assign element type, highlight all of the elements in the screen, and then go through the hexes, wedges, and tets, and then switch them to a hybrid element formulation. And with that, we can go back to resubmit our job and we should be good to go. And now that the message file is indicating that it's starting the process of solving the scenario, we should be good to let this alone and continue its way through the calculation. However, earlier in this video, I talked about the competitive advantage of Abacus over SolidWorks, given that it can be run in a cloud environment. To showcase how much faster that cloud environment can be, I'm gonna let this first simulation run locally on my computer with an A-Core solve, and let that have a little bit of a head start while I upload the file to the cloud, set it up, and then let it run on 36 core. At the point of execution, Abacus CAE takes all of the input from our simulation development, turns it into a text input file, and sends it off to the solver. If instead we didn't want our local machine to solve this, we can upload this to the 3D Experience Simulation Manager and use the cloud resources to solve this job. In this case, I can go to the Setup tab, choose the Abacus version that I want to run, and then change the results format to be in the legacy ODB because we're working with CAE today. Now we can switch back over to the Content tab, right-click on the IMP file, and select Run. From here, we can set up our solve environment. In this case, we're going to be using credits, and I'm going to take a 36-core distribution. Now we'll click run to launch the job, and then I'll flash forward into the future once we have some results for us to review. Now that the solver is finished up and given us a completed message, we can go back to the content tab and download the ODB. From there, open up the ODB in CAE, and we can start to investigate some of the results. First, what I'm going to do is plot the von Mises stress in the deformed condition. Then I'll take a cross-section through the longitudinal axis of this control arm, just so we can see everything that's happening inside the bushing area. Now when I let the simulation play out through time, you can see that the two bushings go in relatively easily, but it's the brass pin that seems to have a lot of resistance and a lot of counteraction in the process. In my case, I think we need to back off some of the interference for that brass pin. But before we make any changes to the design, we should probably look at the forces required to install that brass fitting. We could do that by using the history output for the reactionary forces and the displacement for that control node on the center coupling of the brass pin. Inside the history output, we'll go and select our reactionary forces and save as a vector magnitude. Same thing for the spatial displacement. And that'll give us exactly what we need. However, if we were to plot these, this would be time versus value. And instead, we really want to see displacement versus value. So we can use a operation on XY data to combine the two together. And sometimes what I like to do is I'll plot the expression before I actually save it. That way I make sure the XY arguments are the way that I anticipate them to be forces on the y-axis, and that's exactly how I want it, so I'll save this and I can plot it. Now I'll use the probe to look at the actual data, and I can pick out whatever points that I'm looking for, and you'll see at the peak point, we're seeing a little over 2,000 newtons. This high of an installation force seems pretty excessive to me. So what we'll do is we'll go back to our SOLIDWORKS geometry, and we'll modify the amount of interference that is modeled with the brass pin. We can do this by changing the external diameter for the brass fitting. As a first guess for the next iteration, we can knock off about 25 thou. Now because we use the SOLIDWORKS associative interface in Abacus, this is going to be a very simple change to our simulation environment. What I'll do here is I'll put the two side by side again. We'll put SOLIDWORKS on the left and Abacus on the right, again in the assembly module. 
We'll check to see that the associative interface is currently active by checking to see if it has an active port. We're good there. So we'll save the assembly in the SOLIDWORKS side and then re-export it over to the Abacus side. And you'll see when we re-export it, everything will stay the same except for the brass fitting that we changed. That mesh is no longer valid, so it is not shown in the assembly module. Now what's best about the associative interface is that if you don't make any major changes to your geometry, those partitions will still be valid. This being the case, all we have to do is check to see if we're still comfortable with the global seed, and then mesh the part. Then we can switch back over into the assembly tab and see that everything's good to go. And then in this case, rather than submitting the job for analysis, we'll simply write to an input deck. Now that we have our text-based input file, we can go back over to Google Chrome, delete all the content in the simulation manager, and drag and drop that IMP file up to the cloud. Let it upload for a second, and then I'll let this solve on the exact same distribution, 36 cores. Just as I did before, I'm going to fast forward into the future, and once we have some results, we'll start to review then. So now that the second simulation is finished running on the cloud, we can go and check the message file to see how long it took to run. In this case, it was about 1300 seconds, or we can switch over to the summary tab and see the solver duration for each of the solves. And you can see when we relax the amount of interference for the brass fitting, it takes much less time to solve. Just as before, we'll switch back to the content tab, download the ODB, and jump back over into CAE to start reviewing the results. Again, we're going to animate the cross section so we can see what's happening in the bushing. And as we hit play, we can see that the brass fitting goes in as simply as the bushings do. Qualitative data is nice, but let's see what the reactionary forces look like. Again, we'll open up the XY data manager. This time we'll clear out the old data so we're not accidentally looking at the wrong thing and we'll go back into requesting the history outputs. Again, we'll scroll down to our reactionary forces and save as vector magnitudes. Same thing with the spatial displacement. Now back in the XY data manager, we'll hit create and operate on XY data. And this time we can just type the word combine into to call the function and then double click on our sources of XY data in order to put them into the function. And in this case, when I plotted it, just double check, we'll see that I accidentally put the displacement on the Y axis and not on the X axis. So now I can correct that, go back, save it, and we can look at the data itself. This time we're looking at approximately 670 newtons for the installation force of that fitting, which I'm much more comfortable with considering we came from 2200 newtons. And that about rounds out the set of demonstrations we have for this video. If you have any questions about the content you saw today, feel free to comment below. And if you want to learn more about the competitive advantages of Abacus over tools like SolidWorks Simulation, we'll also leave a few links below in the description for further reading. Again, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you're up to date with all of our future SOLIDWORKS simulation and Abacus videos. And comment below if you have a topic you'd like for us to cover in the future. If you're the kind of person that's excited about FEA, you can find more information about any upcoming events we have at GoEngineer.com, as well as get access to professional training content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.